Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode eight of the Bearded Time podcast. I am one of your hosts, Brad, joined by my co-host, Ricardo. And for the first time ever, we have a special guest on this podcast, uh, joined by none other, the man, the myth, the legend, uh, fellow watch with this contributor, Spanish Rob. What is up, man? How's it going? It's going good. 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 Uh, Rob is here. Excited to be here. (laughs) <laughs> we're excited to have you you're here uh because you have a little bit more expertise on arguably the biggest uh one of the biggest like watch industry uh drama news that happened over the past weekend uh, which we'll get into in a little bit uh before we do that though because we always forget but i'm not forgetting this time we have to do the customary uh wristwatch check so we'll start with our guest uh spanish rob what are you wearing today um, so my go-to that I wear almost all the time is my, uh, IWC Aqua Timer Galapagos covered in rubber. It's got a 12-hour counter. I can get it wet. I can do all these different things in it. So it's what I usually wear. Um, and I didn't wear it to the gym, but like I did a core class with my girlfriend just now. And uh, I actually wear like my gym watch, which is, um, I think now it's been, oh my God, it's been like 12 years now. I've had this Tissot T-Touch Tactile PVD. It's 12 years old. Um, I got it when I used to work corporate for Tourneau, and it still, uh, it still works, still keeps, keeps it going. It, it's been rock climbing and a lot of different things. So when I do any kind of uh, activity, like the core class we just did, um, I wear this. Okay. Cool. Nice, nice. So, so you want to go there, Brad, or, or should I just... Uh... Uh, you should definitely go ahead and go first. Um, so I am wearing... Um... The, the forgotten child of um, the Cassie Oaks, um, the red Cassie Oak. Everybody loves the black, but um, a, a touch of red never hurts. And um, yeah. Oh, wow. that's so cool. I, I'm starting to, like, it's really growing on me. Um, it, it's a so, nice pop of color. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to interrupt. What are you, what are you, Giancarlo now? You're buying watch every week now? <laughs> This is my, you could say this is my first watch purchase of the year. Um, mm. And I can't even say it was a purchase. It was a gift. Um, it's hard to turn down this nice, really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, funny thing is, I don't know if it'll, I'll be wearing it often because my wife gave it one of those. Hmm. <laughs> which means you know, I'm not going to see it a couple mornings because she's probably going to sneak away with it. But um, no, it's nice. I, I, I like it. Um. The biggest problem I tend to have with uh, G-Shocks is it's hard to press the buttons. Um, very annoying. But on this, it's actually pretty simple. Um, but yeah, no. Nah. And it is legible. I know a lot of people have been complaining about the legibility. Um, I haven't had any problems with it. If I really can't read the digital display, hey, there's a light button. So works for me. Very cool. Uh, I'm wearing the Monta Sky Quest uh, back on the bracelet for the first time in a couple of months. Uh, I'm getting ready to do my one year yes. review on this watch. Um, so I'm just kind of reminding myself why it's awesome. Basically, also just listened to the Monta episode of 10 and 2 recently. So I'm kind of like in a Monta zone right now. I'm wearing this a bunch actually over the last couple of days. So. Is this to remind you it's awesome so you don't go ahead and sell it? I'm not it selling awesome? this watch, Ricardo. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. A lot of times when people say they need to be reminded of a watch's awesomeness, it's because they've been thinking about selling the watch. So no, I'm, no, I'm no, just no. Saying. I'm just no, 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 no. I, that, that is absolutely not happening. Uh, not now and probably, probably not ever, though I will say I know we're not doing Watch of the Week this week, uh, but those new the green uh, they go nine f quartz watches uh the the sixtieth anniversary ones Look oh yeah we we're, we're at some point in time we're gonna have to talk about that um if we if we could fit that into this show, preferably that would be cool but we're not gonna be able to think, but we'll talk yeah. about it next episode because <laughs> that might be like a thirty minute conversation by itself, so yeah, because like i said i I, th- I think I finally found the grand Sega that I want, and of course it has to be the one that's like <laughs> the most expensive nine f quartz that they make basically right now because why wouldn't it <laughs> naturally so. boo ceramic yeah, bezel okay. boo so um so yeah the reason uh rob has a little bit more insight and a little bit more knowledge about the situation that's that went on that took the watch internet community by storm last weekend we're of course referring to uh the the downfall of horology house uh a gentleman who i did not even realize sold watches on the side like i thought he just 
had a channel where he did, had fantastic videography and photography and was very knowledgeable about these things. Yeah, the house came tumbling down. Uh, quickly. <laughs> quickly. So, Rob, catch us up to kind of just, I guess, for those that hadn't heard about the situation or don't know much about it, kind of lay the groundwork for what exactly happened with the show. <clears throat> now, I'm not really in the forums, so I'm really more of a, a spectator. Um, and I, I heard about it a few hours after it broke, the story broke. So, I, And I read the thread at that point and then heard stories and different WhatsApp group chats and, and you know, different people told me different things and it's pretty bad. But from the get go, I, I, I completely understood and completely knew for those who aren't familiar, this guy, horology house, Australian YouTube, uh, like a digital creator basically did really good photography, had a YouTube channel and started a, platform on Facebook, a Facebook group where the Australian community could sell and trade watches, sell, buy, trade. So it makes sense. Somebody who puts themselves at the helm of this situation, he decided I'm going to make this Facebook group and be the head of it and be the admin because there's some power. There's a lot of power that comes to Facebook groups that people don't realize. There's a lot of people I know that have been at the helm of Facebook groups and they're deemed as gods. And it's silly. It's really silly because Facebook is the wild west of the watch mm -hmm. community and industry. People don't know shit all. Uh, excuse my language, uh, on Facebook. Um, a lot of the time it's just like run half ass backwards by people who don't know shit at all, but any jackass can have a YouTube, my, you know, obviously. So we're here. here. <laughs> uh, and, um, it, it, so it's, I digress. Um, he does really good quality content, does amazing yes. photography, does amazing YouTube videos, high quality stuff, promotes the hell out of it, you know, builds himself up to this person. Now, as a behavioralist, as a psychologist, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I'm just, I just, I'm passionate and went to school for behavioral psychology. And from the moment when I heard the story, I was like, oh, this is so obviously, clearly, he did this on purpose so he can rob people. He clearly created videos about how to spot fakes to, to gain notoriety and credibility about knowing what real watches are so that he could sell fake watches and nobody would question him. Mm -hmm. um, and that would catch up to him, but that's, you know, that's the, uh, the Ponzi scheme and like the, the thing of the pathological liar and the person that, that does that stuff. So that's just the archetype. Like that's the kind of person who's going to do it. They pay people off and when things go wrong, they're like, they pull them off, they string them along and get money from other people to pay off that first person. And that just keeps going and keeps going until they eventually get caught, it catches up to them, which is mm -hmm. silly um, because from all the stories, I don't know if you've read it, if, you, if people are watching this around, if you've read it, um, there's just, it's one thing to say, oh, well, you know, I want to hear all the story. I want to, I don't want to judge to, to conclusion and blah, blah, blah. And I get that. That's fair. Completely fair. Not to, to judge on that, but where, there's a definite cross of like, no, this, this guy is a criminal is all the lies and all the strings of lies and, and all the, the communication that he's had with all these people, the, the pattern of promising things and not actually having the watch people are saying, Oh no, I actually let him borrow that watch. That was a video. He didn't own it. And he never really did. So he was just stringing people along, making people think that he actually had product, took their money, try to get it to make a profit. And then when he couldn't like use that money, for whatever he was using it to until he had to get it from other people to give it back to these original people. Mm -hmm. um, and there was just so many lies and, and it was, it was obvious. There was um, for me, I think the nail in the coffin was when somebody saw in one of the conversations he had with somebody, he said, Oh, this is my family's house. It's on fire. And then people quickly did a Google reverse search and found out that's a generic photo from the news. That's not mm -hmm. your parents' house. Like that's what are the odds? It's like in a million different articles. And he used that. And that's the string of lines. That's the pathological liar. That's the archetype. So from that alone, I, I was just like, oh, no, this, this makes 100% sense. This guy made those videos. He created Horology House, the videos, the Australian forum, all of it with the intent of robbing people. That's, that's obvious. And now the reason why so many people are so quick to say, Oh, let's give him a chance. Let's, let's give him, you know, I, I want to hear both sides of stories is because I don't want to take it to that place, but I have to take it to that place. It's because he kind of looks 
like the rest of us in the community. He kind of looks like a person who would be a watch collector. He seems like an enthusiast. You know, he's charming because he has an Australian accent. You know, he's white, blah, 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 blah. He seems affluent. He has good quality products. Like a good quality product, I say, the YouTube videos, you know? Mm-hmm. And a lot of time, and it's just part of society. It's just an issue. It's an issue that we have. It's a thing. We, we, we'll, we deem people that are in suits fancier and we think that they have money. But then, like, in reality, the guys in the sweatpants are coming in buying RMs. And it's just a, that's just a recent mindfuck of how we're disrupting society's hierarchy of how we view people. And, the, mm-hmm. and it hasn't re- caught up to people on YouTube. So a guy who has really good photos, he's white, he's charming, blah, 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 and he makes his good products, then we're like, that guy can't be a crook. And in, in reality, he knew that. And he, 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 on he, prayed, he prayed on society's uh, um, roles of hierarchy, you know, some sort of, brown or shades or you know uh, you know whatever like and maybe he just didn't look trustworthy like if it was an african guy if it was a hispanic guy from colombia peru mexico wherever and he was just like here i'm selling watches and he didn't have a good youtube video i don't think people would be so easy to quickly drop and leave all this money or to to say oh maybe this guy you know is trustworthy you know it, it's and unfortunately that's just part of society and that's just the way it is but that's my my spiel on the whole thing i'm 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 I, I barely strongly believe this guy did it on purpose. It, it's weird. It's um, I'm of the same opinion as you. Um, in the beginning, I thought it was okay. Maybe it's just an instance where he fell down the rabbit hole. Uh, you know, he made, he lied once and then he, he had to lie against to cover that. And But the more and more you read about it, the more and more it just seems like, would like what you're saying, you know, especially when I think in the early, early stages of this, I mean, like a few hours after that, that um, forum post, um, the specific video he had, which identified how to spot a Rolex fake was the first video he decides he's going to pull down. Mm -hmm. So he had the rest of his channel was still up. And the first thing he says, okay, I'm going to take this out is a video that he created, which by the way, it was very good. That's, that's what I'm trying. I'm kind of trying to, to separate this. Like on one end, his stuff was very good. I, I think we all could admit that the quality of his videos, the content was amazing. But it, it feels dirty when you realize that a lot of that was done on purpose to kind of set up a system where, you know, he could sell these watches and people wouldn't question their authenticity. And it's crazy because then once this first guy comes out, now you have other people who dealt with him are like, hey, you know what? Let me have somebody actually take a look at this. Mm-hmm. Which side note, okay, this this still boggles my mind. You're about you're spending nearly thirty thousand dollars on a watch. I don't care how trustworthy somebody looks. The first second I get that sucker in, I'm going straight down to a Rolex dealer, wherever, and I'm seeing, can you authenticate this watch? Even if it costs me a couple hundred bucks to do, I don't care. That's the first thing I'm doing, but it just shows you the power of, of trust and in, in how when you build that trust up with an audience, how easily people can get. And you've never met these people face to face, but just them seeing you and building that trust is enough for people to just blindly not even question what you're doing and just be like, okay, yeah, there's no doubt in my mind this watch is, is real. Yeah, and it's I'm I'm in kind of the same but as well. I mean, Christ, I've I I always have, you know, the willies giving someone like a thousand dollars online for a watch that I don't know that I'm just you know that you that you're going in there. And I, I think the thing that cemented it for me, um, you know, because I'm not gonna be the type of guy to jump down somebody's throats right away. But when not only when more people started coming out of the woodwork, but like I said, when when the picture of the house fire was that that's that's like the scumbag move right there. Like that that's the one where it's yeah. just like you're bringing you know you're trying to bring a really tragic situation, try to use that as a scapegoat for you know to kind of mask your behavior. And then the thing that really kind of crystallized the situation for me, I have to give credit to my buddy uh, Will, who's uh, does the Watch Clicker website. He posted a story on Instagram. And basically just ran down, like, imagine if you bought a watch, you know, from this guy, got a watch from this guy, even if it's, you know, legit, even if you're trustworthy, like now that doubt is in there. Like you might've saved for this watch for months or years. This might be your grail. This might be a watch that you sought after for a long time. And now you have to sit there and wonder, is it legitimate or is it fake? And, and just imagine kind of how that feels. 
and why the situation is is so messed up and why it, that that's why it is truly tragic and and rob your insight is very interesting i did not expect you to go uh criminal profiler <laughs> so much on this guy um it makes it makes a lot of sense again it's it's kind of hard to truly diagnose the problem from afar because again he's you know half the world away and, and everything else going on um but for me it's just a good reminder of when you're spending this kind of money on on these kind of things this is why these official channels you know aren't going away this is why you know especially when you're talking on the high end on the luxury side of things that there's always going to be room for these ad's like even in, in a world where retail is very quickly moving online like watch ad's are going to still continue to persist because for reasons like this when you're dealing with these things they cost tens of thousands of dollars and there is an authenticity you know potential for fakes to be about that that that's not a chance that i'm taking it's worth me spending the extra you know five grand or ten grand to ensure that i'm getting the genuine article than to be out you know twenty five thousand dollars because it was a great deal, but it's a fake at the end of the day. You know, it's crazy. Now that you say that, I'd love to see an analysis <laughs> of how much the price on, on, on Rolex Daytona's went up right after this happened mm -hmm. from, from official channels. It, it's, it's almost like advertising for buying it in the official way. So I'd love to see if maybe it would ticked up a couple point, points just as a reaction to, hey, you know what? Huh, very clear example of why you should be buying it from us. And since you're going to feel that way, we're going to just compute the price up a couple points. I'd love to see an analysis on that. Absolutely. So, but yeah, we're just a completely out of the blue situation too. Because again, by, by all accounts, um, this was a guy who was, you know, like we mentioned, very well respected within the community um put out a good product and again just a just a good reminder to always keep um everyone at arm's length like i said <laughs> it's it's, it's leave, always, yeah, yeah don't let your guard down yeah don't let your yeah. guard down so but uh but like there was uh, one last thing i wanted to say about this oh, sure. yeah, go ahead. Uh, i'm sorry the my internet's a little slow so it's it's a little overlapping um now i forgot what i was going to say but essentially it was i spoke to a, a prominent youtuber um probably one of the best youtubers who makes like the best videos right now on YouTube, uh, watch guy. And he, I asked him about his comments about it. And he's like, listen, I, I don't even know if I can say anything just yet, but no, like between you and me, like, that's just, let's do this comeback. <laughs> like, that's just, it just seemed like, it, it just seems like everything is really bad. Mm -hmm. And in reality, in all honesty, it hurts all of us, mm -hmm. all the YouTubers and all the people who make content because now, you know, our credibility is going to be, is going to take a hit because now people are gonna be like, can we trust these people? What are their motives? And to be honest, I say people need to do their homework, need to do their due diligence, they need to be weary. And I think this serves as a warning for us to not be so, you know, letting our guard down, just so off guard on how we transact and how we buy watches and how we do stuff. The winner in this situation was, is brands. The brands and the retailers are gonna win. The secondary market took a hit from this story. The secondary market is such a big deal right now and it's taken a slight hit because of this because now trust is such a big deal. And what do brick and mortars and brands have at their disposals? Trust. Why do you buy something from a brick and mortar store? It's because of the trust. And that's one of the few things that they had and they were losing that. That's like one of the few things they have. This kind of sets us back now. And the brick and mortars, which I love brick and mortars, you know, they have, you know, I love the brands and all that, but they now they have some ground to stand on and say, well, hey, you don't know who you're buying from. And dealers also going to say that because uh, I was thinking before when you were, we were talking about how can anyone give 15000 or 30000 or 60000 that one, the one guy gave them $60,000, um, you know, without really knowing him. And uh, the reality is uh, any dealer would have seen a situation and said, oh, no, this is literally why we have these checks and balances within the dealer community mm -hmm. because of stuff like this. So they blackball people and yeah. they're very quick to, they're very quick to, you know, call people out. So I can't stress this enough to the people watching this. He's going to go away and he's going to go away for like 10 years and he's going to resurface under a different name, a different, whatever. Yeah. Remember the face, remember Chris Essery, remember the name, remember the face. Cause this guy's going to come back in five, 10 years. And he's going to try to sell watches. Maybe he'll come back in 10 years and, and rip people off with cars. Who knows? But don't forget the name. Don't forget the face. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about some of the things that are in place. Like I know someplace online, you'll have escrow accounts. <coughs> you'll have like 
things that are in place for stuff like this not to happen. And but but you're right that the the secondary market, which I think a lot of us live off of, because not all of us can walk into AD and just buy a watch right off the, the right out of the box. You're right. It took a huge hit. They like just just confidence, trust. It's it, it sucks. It really does suck. It does. Um, uh, we, we were going to talk about move, movement snobbery next, but Ricardo, you uh, mentioned the secondary market. This actually floats nicely into um, one of the other topics that we were going to discuss this week, something that you brought up again um, on the Microbrand Watches Facebook group. And it was a question that literally, like, I think I saw it like literally two minutes after you posted it. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I saw the question, I'm like, well, we have to talk about this on the show. Like, it's yeah. a fantastic question. Yeah, I, it, so it's weird. Like, as a watch guy, like, I'll walk through my day and then I'll pause one out of nowhere and I'll just start thinking about something and I can't get it out of my head. And I'm just like, you know, I need to talk to other people and see if they're in the same mindset as I am. So um, I, one day I was at work and I just hopped on horology talk on, um, on Facebook and I just put the question out there. I said, and I'm just talking from my experiences. And I was asking people, which do you prefer? Do you prefer buying um, buying a watch brand new, being the first owner, or um, basically getting that brand brand new car smell, or do you prefer buying used and being the second owner, or maybe the third owner on the watch, um, as long as of, of course it's in good condition? And the the main reason I was asking that question is because, and and you see it a lot, the hit that you take as a buyer, as the first buyer of a watch, is so big. It's, 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 it can be 20, 30, 40% on some watches. And, and, the, and this is also building on top of what we were talking about last week. People have to realize, yes, there are a handful of watches that will, are, are, will go up in price um, or won't lose any value. But 99% of the watches being sold in the world lose their value, lose a good portion of their value the second they're bought. Mm-hmm. And just like a card. Yep. And yep. and you know, there were a couple of responses where people are just like, you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't be buying based off of value, which I completely agree. Well, hold, hold on. Yeah, we'll, get <laughs> we'll get there. So you know that, there were there's that group of people that are just like, you know what, you should just be buying the watch to buy the watch and enjoying it. Um, which is cool in terms of if you know you're buying the watch and you're 100% sure that you're going to keep it. Most of us are not 100% sure that we're going to keep the watches that we buy. So I, I, no matter how in love you are in, with the watch, most of us are not 100% sure. So to know that you're buying something and it's going to decrease tremendously in value, you know, it's going to hover around your head. It's going to be a thought in the, in the process when you're going out to buy the watch. And it, once again, builds up on, on the conversation we had last week about um, the watches and their pricing structure and all these things. But I just put the question out there and I want to ask it to you guys, you know, where do you stand on this? Because me personally, if I could find, I, I never want to take that hit. If I, my, Basically, the most expensive watch in my collection right now is my Tudor Black Bay Steel. I bought that watch secondhand. I saved a tremendous amount of money buying that watch secondhand, and that watch was in pristine condition. So for me, I, I have no problem doing that. But I wanted to just throw it out to you guys. What, you know, what do you guys think? In, unless you're wealthy to the point where losing that value is trivial, most watch enthusiasts that I know have sold at least one watch that they previously owned at some point in time. Like, like uh, uh, to me, it's inconceivable that that part of the conversation would not at least factor into your purchasing. Like that, I literally did a video on this a couple months ago about like kind of the factors that I look at and and how I weigh them in importance when I'm going to buy a watch. And that loss in value is absolutely one of those things that I'm going to do because especially in this, you know, kind of day and age buying watches, when we buy so much stuff online, so much stuff that we've never gotten in our hands before, so much stuff sight unseen, you don't know if you're going to, if that watch that you're crushing on online is, if you're going to maintain that, 
that same feeling of, of, of you know, like crushery or enthusiasm for that watch once you get in your hands. Uh, I mean, for me, perfect example, the Bull of a Lunar Pilot, when I, when I bought that watch, looked amazing online. I'm like, this is the chronograph that I've been looking for. I get it in. I wear it for a couple of weeks and I'm just like, and I just didn't, it didn't click with me. It didn't really bond with me. If I had spent the retail price, which I think was like 650 on that watch and then sold it for what I sold it for, which was like 290, I would have been pissed. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not, you know, I have some money to burn, but just kind of lighting $300 on fire doesn't sound like my idea of a good time. So like I said, I scoured for that watch. I, I said, look, you know, I looked at the difference in value between what the watch went for new and what it went for used. And I said, this is a watch that I'm going to have to buy pre-owned because the value hit is, is, is the, the loss is just too steep. Again, I don't understand why anyone like, and, and I get people that, you know, buy watch, buy a watch. Cause you love it, buy a watch for the right reasons. And, and I, I understand that. I know that, you know, we in particular are in a bit of a different situation, you know, especially me as well, because I'll buy something that I know I'm going to sell a couple weeks later, just for the sake of reviewing it to get, you know, to get hits on YouTube and stuff like that. So like, I've done that before I'll do it again, but yeah, for, for the average person, I can't imagine why that would not be a thing that would factor into the conversation. And there are very few watches that are worth buying new for this reason. Like you said, Ricardo, like over 99% of the watches sold take a dramatic loss in value. Thanks to things like the gray market and things of that nature that absolutely should be a factor. People are crazy if they say that it's not. Robbie? There's so much I could say on this topic. Um, <laughs> there's so much I want to say, and I'm like thinking all these things. I'm like, oh, man. Oh, I, know, I know. I know. You know what? It's funny. I know exactly what you're thinking. I know. What do I attack it, this? <laughs> yeah. I like, how can right, I attack so. this in a way that's kind of not, but at the same time, it's, it's just, it's realistic. It's there. Like, no matter what people may say or how people may feel, it's just the way the market is right now. So, so yeah, go ahead. Let me, let me start with playing devil's advocate. And let me tell you about how I've worked in retail and I've seen the people. And I, and I have a lot of friends I know who are like this, just being in these different collectors groups and, and doing different group like meetings around the world mm -hmm. and meeting so many different types of clients, so many different types of collectors. And to play devil's advocate, I know... I remember uh, a guy, this was back when I used to work for Paddock, um, and a lot of these guys were like that. They could because they, 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 they buy brand new because they can, and, and buying something secondhand was not even an option for them, mm -hmm. and it was a very big hurdle, um, and it's something they would never do. It's like, for them, it was like putting on someone else's huge sock, and they were like, <laughs> why would I do that? That's gross. They wanted that, like, that. All right, that's that. fair. But these Plastic. dudes, oh my God. So there's that and there's, people who, <laughs> there's that. And there's so many people who I know that like would buy brand new solid gold watches, bracelet and everything. And we have the pristine. And then like, if they got a single scratch on them, they would flip them three months later. And I was just like, how'd you not get a scratch on it in the first three months? <laughs> <laughs> I would have, I would have. I would have breathed on it wrong and scratched it within the first five minutes of walking out the store, but that's me, and that's okay. I don't I really care about other kind of stuff. But I also keep things like forever. I've only sold like maybe a handful of watches in my collection, like my entire life. Um, I'm one of the people who actually keep shit for way too long, um, <laughs> and it's I get I get part of our of our you know collectors group of our enthusiasts. A lot of it's about trading like baseball cards, and it, it's fun. So I get it. I hundred percent get it. Um, I have just such a weird sentimental about like attachment to like every friggin' stupid thing. So I'm just like, I need to keep it forever because it, it was this day, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but that being said, there's a lot of people and it also depends on culture. You know, if you go to like, ah, there's so many different parts of like Southeast Asia, you know, down Southern, like South America or, or India, certain cultures are like so about having the pristine things that need to have a brand new getting something secondary market is unheard of if you're uh for those who may have or have not shopped in japan japan is probably one of the, one of the better places to buy things because if something has like barely a scratch it's like the cheapest place to buy it because they're just so like oh we're so sorry this is like it's 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 basically damaged goods we're giving it that's, away that's and why I was they, like, what <laughs> what are you saying that's why their rating system is so good when you oh buy yeah, in the Japanese market. Like they would literally tell you, we value this at ninety three percent good, and you're like, how the hell are you calculating ninety three percent good? But oh the, yeah, 
they're that particular about the quality of the watch when you're buying it. Like there's so many uh, watches I've seen through eBay where the seller is like very particular. Glass, A. <coughs> Case, 93%. And high def photos of any scratch on it. It's, it's crazy, but continue, man, continue. Um, I always, when I talk to people about the watch industry, people who don't know anything about watch, parallel each other, parallel each other, almost identically in almost every aspect, whether it's like, you know, you have people who write about cars, you have people who make the manufacturer, you have people who sell used cars, you have people who write and do photography and their shows and like all that stuff. It, and it parallels the watch industry almost to the T and the secondary market and the value of watches is not, no other exceptions, exactly the same. When you drive it off the lot, you, you get a, a huge hit in, in percentage of the value, as you said. So that's obviously a very true statement. And only now in the last 10, 15 years, because of the boom in technology, because that pool of people who buy watches has grown exponentially, where when I started in this industry, when I was a young 23-year-old kid, this was like, or 22-year-olds, it was um, like 46 year old, like very specific, very wealthy, just males, blah, blah, blah. And because of technology and social media and everything is blown up, now you have such a bigger pool of people and you have that middle class that's gone so much bigger. And now you have people buying watches that may not have bought watches before because they couldn't afford it. You know, before it may have been only the wealthy, but also watches were a lot more uh, affordable back then. You know, your, your watches were two to three to $5,000 for like an Omega, a Breitling, a Tag Heuer. You know, you're in the one to $3,000 range. Um, and things have just grown so much. The inflation of all of it is, is gone, has been absurd. And I've always questioned, like, how much can this industry be sustainable by these increasing prices? Mm-hmm. And Hayek did, when, when he did this in 2006, seven, he was just like, we're going to take away the movements. And you had people like Peter Stoss, who I, I think is legendary. And it's funny because all of you who make all the biggest movements in Switzerland are not Swiss. You have, you have Hayek who's Lebanese comes in shakes up the industry, saves the industry, but also shakes it up in his, as his legacy before he leaves, before he passes away in 2011. He says, I want Switzerland to be more creative. I want people to stop using my movement in every single watch. Cause there was a little bit of swatch in every watch, which was a saying back in the 2000s. And he inspired people to make their own movements. And I said, that sounds great, but it's not as a consumer and someone who was very, very like poor middle-class or lower middle-class, especially that time, I was just like, this is not a good idea. This is going to drive the prices up. Not, mm-hmm. not every Tom, Dick, and Harry needs a goddamn automatic in-house chronic, like in-house movement from Cartier or Breitling. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, no one needs that. That's mm-hmm. not necessary. So thank God it paired up with the, the boom in te- with technology and the, the growing pool of people that said, all right, we can't buy this shit. We're not going to buy it brand new. We're going to buy it secondary work because what that did that technology smarter buyers because now they can look things up you have platforms like crown 24 and crown and caliber etc cetera, etc cetera, who now gave us a basis of we can look things up and now we can be a smart consumer so to go to your point about all right what's going on with the secondary market and what's how's it affecting i read um i got intel from a french uh website like a paid website an industry newspaper and I had it translated for me and I didn't, I didn't read all of it, but a lot of it was saying, it's funny because it's like this French secretive kind of like newspaper thing that you would pick a lot of money to, to read. It was very much like blasting Hayek and the Swatch Group because their numbers, and I hate to say this because like I love the people who work at Swatch Group and I love Swatch Group and I love some of the products that they make. So don't consider this like bashing or anything, mm-hmm. but they've been, they've been, they've been, they're, they're tanking. They're tanking hard. And that might be the reason why they're like, we probably shouldn't do this time to move thing because that was such an ego project. That was such a like, Oh, you know, big dick, this big dick, that we're going to leave Basel. We're going to do our own thing. And only to discover. Yeah. Only to discover they're spending just as much money, if not more. So what was the point? Wow. Like you're, 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 you're flying people in, you're doing this whole, they'll, then they realize how expensive it is to run a conference. So you're not sharing the, the spend amongst a bunch of different brands. You're doing it yourself yourself and paying all your staff and paying all these people to get there like that is it's probably as expensive maybe it's not as expensive but it's probably almost as expensive and that's why they're they're not doing the best right now and a lot of people are, are a lot of industries as technology evolves a lot of industries are tanking from like fedex to you know because of amazon being you know a leader in that category to several other industries including people like 
you know, Swatch Group would, had a, a great run of selling brand new. And when they bought WatchFinder UK, that was the signal. That was such a significant day in the history of the watch industry because that was a major player manufacturer selling brand new watches who says, we're going to get in the pre-owned game because we realized how much money we're losing by not selling secondary markets. And that was a twofold maneuver that was – we're going to, all this, the brand new watches that we can sell, we get back at that, the years prior to that, the two years prior to that, there were, there were stories about how they were buying back four to $100 million worth of their own product. Mm. And if they sell their stuff, secondary market, basically discounted and sell it as, as a secondary market using this vehicle of watch finder by joining that race, you know? So secondary market is very important. It's, uh, it's here to stay. It's a really big part of the industry, real Essentially what I was saying before we got cut off because my internet connection is not the best is that you have all these companies sprouting up. You have Watchbox who's doing hundreds of millions of dollars. They're, they're opening up, you know, uh, command centers or chains all over the world in Singapore, Hong Kong, and uh, Inu Chattel where I did a couple of videos and they're, they're, they did, you know, you have the real real, which has been every year just being getting bigger and bigger. And there's a bunch of other ones that maybe people don't even know of that haven't heard of. So this secondary market is a, uh, is a real, real threat to the industry. And I hope it sparks some sort of change. I, I like that you have some brands like Jaeger that play it safe and their prices haven't really changed in the last like 15 years. They were always in that same price. Cause they just, they, they decided that they could be, they were always a great value and they're still a great value. Even though they're going you know, to $8,000 average, they're mm-hmm. still, they're still good. So that secondary market is a really big deal. It's, I personally, I, I don't even have a brand new car. I've, I buy used cars. I buy used watches. I buy like secondhand everything I prefer because as a smart consumer, it's the best way to do it, whether it's furniture or I don't know, God knows what. This I got for my birthday last year or 2018, I remember. And I uh, bought this secondhand, but I'm an opportunist. So I've wanted this watch since uh, Adam let me borrow his it, when you know with the beginning of the heydays of red bar when we were just forming and kind of like you know, it was becoming a thing i remember he let me borrow this um for like a month and i was so in love with it it was my, my favorite ibc because it's completely coated in rubber you can use it in the water the chronograph it's a screw down crown it's got a unidirectional bezel and it's a 12 hour counter which i com- i demand from my chronograph none of this 30 minute bullshit <laughs> I, do things, I do things that are way longer than 30 minutes whether it's you know, shotgun, good, cooking whatever <laughs> like it's it's so much more than 30 minutes. So I need to, I need to over counter. Um, I lost my place. I'm like, you guys got to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're keeping that. That's not going. Uh, all right. Well, but, anyway, so I, I bought this from my good friends at Crown and Caliber for $3,000 mm-hmm. um, because I waited seven years for the right price. And I knew that they were like in the four or $5,000 range. And then, you know, Crown and Caliber is probably one of the best values hidden values out there, you know, big, you know, shout out to my friends at Crown Calvin. They're, fun, they're great. And uh, I was able to get this at a bargain, you know, so I, I definitely believe in buying, buying yeah. used. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's weird. In the tech world, you'll have the early adopters of people who will be the first online for like an Apple iPhone. But I think a lot of people in the watch world, especially as the prices start to go up, and of course, when you're not dealing with certain brands like a Rolex or Patek, they're willing to have the patience to wait for that watch. Especially when you know that that watch is going to stay with you for a long time. It, it, it pays to just stand by and kind of be like, okay, it's going to get to a point where I'm just going to be, I'm going to be comfortable with the price because it's so evident that these prices are, or that they're, they're putting out there is just not what the market is gonna bear. Like it, it, it's like they're putting a hundred, and the market is saying no. This is sixty, <laughs> and no matter how hard they fight it, it's gonna be sixty. And and, and that's the crazy thing. And then you were mentioning the whole thing with Swatch, it, it, especially when you think about the used market. Think about this: you have one Omega Speedmaster that was made, let's say, four years ago. It could go through four hands. That's four potential people who could have bought a new one, but they're wait. They're literally waiting for that one, 
And yet every year they're producing more of that watch. So it's going to get to a point where they're going to have more supply than people are, 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 are demanding. And, and, you know, you have patient buyers. We were talking about this last week. You have a younger, a younger demographic who's not here for all the funny business. They, I mean, <laughs> where, and you could tell, you could definitely correct me since you have more experience in the retail realm. You, you have, it always felt like you had older buyers who could, would walk into a shop. They don't care what the price was, they'd buy it. You'd have younger buyers who always pause on the price because to them, they're kind of feeling like, uh, some younger, most younger buyers, I think at a younger age, you're talking like maybe between 20s, 20s up to like mid 30s that might nowadays pause before just making a huge purchase like that and actually do a little bit more research, realize that buying it brand new, they're taking way too much of a hit and might just say, you know what, I'll have the patience for this because there's so many other things they got to worry about. It's just, I don't know, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, if that's not what you kind of saw in your years in retail. It's, it's, it's a lot of that, but it's, it's also the impatience it's also, it's a lot of that. It's also the impatience of people who are willing to spend 150000 or twice or three times over retail to get it immediately. But now you're talking about the hierarchy of the people with the wealth. So the wealthiest will pay that and, and, and are, are indirectly causing themselves to pay more money because they, high, they pay a premium. If somebody's willing to pay a premium, then the premium is going to go up. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you, you're right. It's, it's both, it goes both ways. And, yeah. you know, so it's, you're, you're not wrong. Yeah. So, yeah. But oh, and, what I was, the last thing I was going to say was uh, about Swatch Group. That article that I read was that they're not doing well. And I, I think it has something to do with the secondary market. I think that they're struggling to buy, sell brand new watches and that it's, uh, it makes sense. I mean, it was evident when that whole thing happened in the mid-2000s. I was like, this isn't going to bode well, especially if we're on the, you know, on the edge of a recession. You know, like what, what people are going to, the, the watch industry is going to slow down quite a bit. And they're going to have to produce less watches, which is going to mean less jobs and less money and blah, blah, blah. But I think they just, I think everyone needs to be cons- just more conscious of the pricing, how much they make and, you know, and demand. They need to be more conscious about the demand, but you know, the demand was something that most brands have played with for a long time. And when the reason we have a great market is because, Sometimes they make way more watches than there is demand. And then that's what gets flooded into the gray market. Yeah. There's a lot of watches that are out there because and, they couldn't and, sell it. Yeah. And no matter whether they take full responsibility for being the person that put it on the gray market, <laughs> it's still there. Whether they're, <laughs> whether well, they're, because it, be, it becomes like a, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy at some point because by them funneling watches over there, they're just creating the situation that makes it hard for them to sell watches at the price that they want to sell the watches for. Yeah. And it's no, it, it, it was just going to say, it's no longer connected to just a particular watch model that then becomes the standard for the brand. Like it, it, it's no longer just, Oh yeah, there's one model that happens to be in the gray market and it's discounted. No, it becomes, Oh no, that's a brand. I now know I can find on the gray market for a discount. And it just messes up all the other watches that they're, they're planning to put out there. But what were you going to say, Rob? I was thinking about how there's certain brands that uh, they are recorrecting themselves. Um, you have brands that are now correct, doing this correction by tightening, squeezing uh, the demand, by releasing fewer and fewer watches, cutting ADs. You know, there's a lot of brands that have been cutting ADs left and right tons tons you go to the watch shows and watch fairs and talk to the brands you talk to the 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 watchmakers some of the ceos in there they'll tell you yeah they're cutting ad's and and for the sole purpose of restricting access to create a demand so they could sell more watches Mm -hmm. um do they care that the watches like a rolex goes to the secondary market and sells for twice as much they don't care but the demand and the brand history the brand uh the most important thing that a brand can do is not sell watches It's have this presence It's have the importance of the brand itself. The brand image is something you can't buy. So it's something they need to create and they can either do it by hard work and popularity, get lucky, uh, you know, millions and millions of marketing or the demand, the demand squeezing mm-hmm. by, uh, by creating this demand and, and, and having that, you know, that brand uh, importance 
is probably one of the most important things a brand can do. And that's why like Paddock hit it on the nose and did it so well. And, you know, once upon a time, they used to be such a hard watch to get a rare watch. It used to be, you could just walk in and get one, but you couldn't get it because of how, you know, Paddock was like a $12,000 watch at one point when everything else was $2,000. So that in itself was like something that made it very hard to get. Cause if you wanted a more complicated one, they're in the twenty thirty thousand dollars range, which was unheard of for, you know, I, there weren't that many watches that were that expensive, you know, so many years ago. So they had put themselves in this category that made them unobtainable. Then they kind of dropped the ball by making too many watches. And they, they decided with the whole boom and with the Chinese market and the Chinese started buying things back in the 2000 to 2012, 2014, mm. um, they started buying everything. And Paddock quietly started making more watches and they made a lot of watches, but this would be their, not their downfall. Cause they're not, they're not, they're, they're doing well. They're thriving. It doesn't matter but they've sold too many, too many watches. And now that demand is like very, very focused on certain models because mm-hmm. there's a lot of them. There's a lot of paddocks, paddocks there, yeah. to be honest. There's, I mean, even the, don't let people lie to you. Even the rarest of the rare paddocks, there's a ton of them out there. There's tons and tons of them because a lot of them are produced. Mm-hmm. But I digress. Yeah. Quick question before we, we, we head off to the next topic. Sure. When when you guys are buying or looking to buy a watch and you happen to realize that you can't find it anywhere on the secondary market, do you take that as the watch must be good and nobody's selling it second? Or do you take it as maybe that brown that brand just isn't selling as many watches as you thought? There's so many additional questions like how long has the watch been in the market? Um I'll give I'll give an example. Well, one of the watches that Brad and I tend to talk a lot about is um, it's this um, Swedish brand called ECA, um, and they they make the the Calypso Sport that that we've been talking about, and it's rare that you actually find one on the secondary market. Like we know from our experience that they make very small production. So one model maybe they make a hundred pieces, um, but at the same time, if take that and then let's say jump it instead of for 100 pieces let's say maybe they're making 500 and you know they make 500 but you're just not seeing them out there on the secondary market do you take that as that brand is doing really good and um and it's and the customers might like it that's why it's not on the secondary market or that brand is not doing so good because you go on their website and you still see the model available so so there's uh, I guess I have to be more specific. There's a specific brand I'm looking at and it's, there's a watch they make that I like a lot. And my normal natural instinct is, Ooh, I like this watch. Let me check the secondary market. I check the secondary market. It's nowhere to be found. So literally the only place, if I want that watch right now is for me to buy it direct from the brand at full retail. Now, part of me is wondering, should I take that as, you know what, that's a real good watch. And if, there must have been somebody be- before me who brought that watch, but I can't find it anywhere on the secondary market. Or just do I just take that as they're not selling as many models as I thought? Brad? See, uh, well, see, for me, I'd be, I'd be checking. I, I would check secondary market history, and I'd be patient. Like, it, it's the same thing. It, like, that's kind of how I was with the E.C. Anderson. Of course, that's a different scenario because they didn't have it available. But, no, I, I, would, I would wait and see. I would wait and see, kind of keep an eye out, put alerts on – that kind of thing. I would assume that the watch is probably good. Um, there might be other reasons why it's not getting bought brand new. Um, you know, price might be a factor, uh, brand equity, you know, Rob talked, you know, made a big point about that. That might be a factor, especially if it's like a micro brand or, you know, like a brand. I, w- I would probably p- play the long game on that and just kind of wait and see mm-hmm. if I can find one eventually. It's a, uh, it's mostly demand and it depends on how long ago the watch came out. Um, there are some people who buy a watch and flip them within six hours or six weeks. And I know many people who do this, like just, they buy it and it's like, it's like, it's a disease. And they're like, I have to get it off my wrist already. And like, I, I think it's hilarious that people buy things and flip them so fast. Um, but uh, it's in this situation for this watch brand that you're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's a specific case of such a small niche brand and such small um, quantities. That's why the ratio of you finding when pre-owned is just so small but again, like, like Brad was saying, it's just, you just any patience because it will happen. Um, and the fact that they're still available for sale, I think might affect people selling them because until they're sold out, will people sell them 
because they feel that they could do okay. If they're going to sell them now, they have to take a loss. And the reality is once they're sold, they can at least sell it for what they paid for, if not more, depending on the popularity, depending on the demand. Right. So, so for a lot of people, people that a year and a half ago, the green alpinist when when they discontinued the SARP 17, all of a yeah. sudden people that had it, that just owned the watch forever, that had no intention of selling it. All of a sudden the watch becomes discontinued prices go up. People are like, well, I got to sell it now because now it's yeah. worth something. So. so you know what? I'm not, afraid, I'm not afraid. I'll just go ahead and say it. The brand is Archimedes. Mm. Archimedes, um, Ickler and, and, and the boys. Um, it's a brand that I've historically found it's very hard to find on the secondary market. Very hard. I'll find Damasco on the secondary market. I'll definitely find Sin on the secondary market. Mm-hmm. But in terms of, of Archimedes, I almost never find them on the secondary market. And it, 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 it's, it's, it's an observation I made recently. I'm just like, I, I'd love to know what is going on. Is it, is it just you know what people buy them, but then to see that they still have it in stock so I could actually buy it. It's just weird. It's playing with my head. <laughs> Watch guy. I can't help it. Um, but uh, you know what? We are definitely running on time. So I want to jump into our, our last topic. Oh yeah. Which I think we kind of touched on a little bit when you started talking about swaps and movements and things like that. Um, one thing that kind of, uh, kind of happens a lot and this happens uh, it's mostly I'd have to say it, it's in effect it's a it's a it's a micro brand thing because mm-hmm. I, I, I think across <laughs> I think across the board I think this this movement is mostly used by micro brands um in some other instances you have larger brands using but I think it's more of a micro brand thing um and that topic is the the the, the kind of hate that Myota um that beautiful citizen um, movement make, making um, company gets um, from a lot of people who are getting into micro brand watches. Um, it's something Brad has seen. It's something I've seen. I know you've probably seen it, Rob. Um, and it's, it's something that I always find interesting because straight off the bat, I feel like if someone is buying a micro brand watch, they're buying it because it's providing them something that they feel they can't get somewhere else. So if that's the case, and a lot of times that tends to be design, um, pricing, and stuff like that. A lot of times, it, it just boggles my mind how many people just jump and just say, well, you know what? It only has this in it, so it shouldn't be this price. And I'm just going to toss that out there and kind of kind of hear your it's, thoughts on this, this, guys. This is such a first world watch reviewer problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, this, so, so this this stemmed from... This, this stemmed from the fact that I just reviewed and posted on, on my channel um, the review of the aforementioned uh, E.C. Anderson Calypso watches. They have a Miyota 9015 movement inside of them, um, and the watch with, you know, a, at a minimum price cost, I think it was like 590 euros, which is like $630, basically. And I knew this would happen because I've reviewed many watches that have Miyota movements in them that cost more than $600. But like clockwork, anytime you post a video on a, a watch like this, you are always going to get people in the comments that come out and say, $600 seems a little steep for a watch with Miyota 9015 in it, don't you think? And it, 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 it just it boggles my mind as to how people get so fixated on one particular aspect of a watch and and then they they extrapolate that out to define the watch's entire value based on that one specific aspect. Now, granted, the movement is going to be the most expensive part of the watch. That's just kind of how it works in most cases, especially if you're talking about micro brands. But watches are more than just the movement inside of them. So, I mean, let, let's dispel a couple of inaccuracies first. First of all, the Miyota 915 is a perfectly good movement. It is it is reliable. It is consistent. Um, and, and the one in the EC Anderson in particular, by the way, is regulated. Like, it's regulated to fall inside of a 12-second range, basically, uh, the, the way that they do it. So it's not like you're getting an off-the-shelf movement. You're getting a well-regulated movement. But besides that, the watch comes with a whole lot more stuff that justifies the extra value and price. And I it just and it kills me because the same you see the same thing when you review – 
like an NTH sub. You saw the same thing when I reviewed the recent uh, Roebuck Diviso watch, which is a $600 Miyota 9015. And people throw out the same stuff. Well, you know, the, the, the rotor makes a noise when it grinds when it's running around sometimes. Or, you know, it, it, it's not the most you know well decorated movement in the entire world i don't give a shit i don't have an exhibition case back on half these watches it doesn't matter but you hear the same complaints but i i just don't understand how many enthusiasts have not evolved their thinking and, and just and to stop fixating on this one particular aspect of the watch and realize that the that the value the, the price range that a watch comes out at is the sum of all of its parts. It's not, ju- it's not like you start with the movement and say, well, because we have a Miyota 9015, no matter what else we do, this watch cannot cost more than $500 because, God damn it, we are not going to price this watch above the $500 market value that the microbrand community places on the Miyota 9015 movement. Now, we put an off-the-shelf base grade at a movement in here. Now we can charge up to $1,200, and people will say, here's, my- here's our money. It says Swiss made on the dial. You can have all the money that you want. It doesn't matter. It just drives me in same and i can't wait to see those comments again the next time i review a six because <laughs> you know what's gonna happen it's really sad but it's this this responsibility falls on the reviewer but it responds full it, the responsibility falls on the brand to market this correctly so there's i always think of this example of the value of 7750 and once upon a time you can get that same movement in a plethora of watches mm-hmm. at all different ranges of pricing, right? Mm-hmm. So whether it's a you know a a, a two thousand dollar Tag Heuer, a three thousand dollar Omega, a five thousand dollar Breitling, or a forty five hundred dollar IWC Pilot Chronograph with the exact same movement, mm-hmm. why were they different prices? And then some of it's justified by the case, the making, the way it's produced, the volume. Like that Breitling, maybe it was a little more expensive, but they had a hell of a lot more polishing. They were Chronomar certified. There were just a million things that made a a $5,000 watch and the IWC had comparable watches and movements to a lot of other brands. And the only real difference was that instead of being stamped out cases, they were CNC cases. And that was really the only difference. And that's where they could charge that premium, which again, unless someone were to explain that to you, but who the hell even knows that, right? Um, Well, when I was a salesman, I knew that, but that's beside the point because that I could, you know, explain to people and explain the difference, but Mm -hmm. you don't always have that nerdy watch person in every watch store or, you know, reading the articles or whatever. So it's kind of like you, like you said, to your point, you have to account for everything. Now, the problem with, you know, you put a Miyota movement that the average micro brand has that has that movement. Let's say, let's, for example, I don't know exactly from two to $600, right? Mm-hmm. And when I've consulted with a lot of micro brands, I've told them in the past, you have to, there's thousands and thousands of micro brands. You have to justify every single penny when you're dealing with micro brands because now you're dealing with a customer base that is looking for a good deal and they have a plenty of choices and to stick out to them you need to be able to justify every single cent so when some brands would come on the scene and be like we're going to charge this much and i'm like that's not how it works without any kind of grounding and and you know a foundation you have to also justify it in in a name brand or connect to something else or some you know gimmicky you know thing isn't going to silly cut it so if these micro brands are using, let's say, Miyota, and they're in the average two to five hundred dollar range, and you have another brand who does six hundred dollars, now you're now you have this due diligence of like the brand has the due diligence of saying, are we marketing? Are we pricing ourselves out of the range because we're using this movement and price? Like, yeah, it's justified. Every penny is justified to cost six hundred dollars because the case is X Y Z and the materials and how we make it and the polishing and blah 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 blah. But now, because like in reality, you're right, hundred percent. This watch, if marketed correctly, if educated to the correct people, you can justify, you're like, $600 is a bargain for this Miyota movement because of everything that it comes with. But again, that's hard to, A, translate, and the brand has a responsibility to say, we might be market pricing ourselves out because the average is here and we're here. We're, it's a gamble. We're rolling the dice and we're possibly gonna not sell as many because of the spec because of the, of the common person and and a lot of times we want to be like this is our product this is what we stand for you know if you like it buy it if not not but then the reality is sales is sales and you actually have to appease to a certain demographic you have to appease to a large enough base to sell your product 
And if you don't, because you price yourself out and you have a smaller segment of the market, then you might suffer. You may not. It depends on how much you make, right? How many, how many, how many models and how many uh, units you're producing. So it's a very risky gamble. And uh, I don't know the brand ECA, ECA, but I've seen it. You know, I've seen Ricardo Ware and stuff. So I don't know too much about it. And uh, it doesn't seem like they're too far off if they're only charging a little bit more. And again, it's also the inexperienced and the uneducated people out there who, who are so quick to jump and say, this looks like this, or this should cost this much because all the other ones cost that much. Why does this have this movement? Well, and you, hit the, you hit the nail on the head. And that's, I think that's why I'm so frustrated because when I filmed the review, when I wrote the outline and did everything, I knew that this was going to come up. So I, I, I consciously, when I'm going through the review, I'm like, here's what here's all the reasons why this watch is awesome and i didn't directly link it to the price it's not like at the end i say well this watch costs 650 dollars, and here's the bullet point list as to why it justifies that but i feel like i did a good job of kind of explaining where the value of the watch lies and, and what makes it great so that when i see comments in there that just are kind of reductive and reduce it down to this base level i feel it, it makes me feel like that i failed as a reviewer not being able to convey the quality that the watch has it's it's weird because people who buy micro brand watches and I include myself in that group. It, it's weird. You never really know what's their main goal behind buying it. Whereas with larger brands, a lot of times it's the brand identity that they're going for. hundred percent. There's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a specific thing, Rolex brand identity, clout, whatever it is. Most of the time, that's what people are going for. What I think is tricky about micro brands is you never know what they're going for. You'll have one guy who will comment on your video and be like, well, I can get a Hamilton for that price. To which I'd respond and say, then buy a Hamilton. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't want a Hamilton. That's why you're looking at this. And because you're looking at this and this looks nothing like the Hamilton you're talking about, how are you now going to come at me and say, oh, um, I could just get a Hamilton with a, a Swiss... Uh, a Swiss edit in it. Cool, you can. Especially on, 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 on the gray market, you'll probably get it cheaper than what I'm selling my current watch for. But that Hamilton is not my watch. It's clearly not my watch. There's no similarities in terms of the look, feel of that Hamilton to my watch. So are you just saying that in hopes of now I'm going to knock you off at the knees and try to get this for dirt cheap? At which point, then no, I, I don't really want to deal with you. But then I, I always felt like there was a group of, of I, I always thought that people who went after micro brand watches were people who were looking for something not like everything else. They wanted something unique. They wanted something affordable, but not to the point where it's, 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 it's like dirt cheap. I mean, because at the same time, they want quality. No matter what they say, yeah, you want it to be affordable, but you don't want that thing to just break off it's, your your wrist. It's the uh, it's it's the Simpsons episode where they're where they're they're doing the focus group with the kids about itchy and scratchy. <laughs> and they're, they're like so, <laughs> like now, do you want wild, new, zany, wacky characters? Like, yeah, this is great, it's awesome. No, or do you want like grounded, down to earth stories with itchy and scratchy? Like, yeah, this is great. So, like, wait, you want <laughs> you want, <laughs> you want both <laughs> and also grounded, down to earth characters? <laughs> It, it, it's, it's, it's so crazy to me because I, if, if they were to stop and actually listen to themselves, um, it, it just, it, if you think about it, it just doesn't make sense. You can't, unless there is a direct comparison, at which point, you know what, I do agree with Rob. It's up to the brand to explain to the customer why my thing is better and why this price is justified. But if I'm providing something that you like that's really not out there, you can't now come at me and be like, well, you know what? I don't really want to pay $700 for it. Nah. Even though it's something I really want, I'm only going to pay $600 for it. Huh? How? <laughs> wow. That makes no sense. Well, micro brands have a hard time being, you know, they're not watch executives. They're people, normal people like you and me who decide I'm going to make a watch brand and how they go about doing it. Some better than others. They don't have the experience. They're not watch execs in Switzerland for 20 years. They don't understand the market or how to do these things or how to market. And some do it really well and some don't do it really well. Some are pretty bad at it. And the reality is the reason why nobody questions IWC is because of the millions of dollars spent on marketing, because of the brand clout, because of the brand. No one says, 
products are overpriced. In reality, they are. They knew that they could charge such a huge premium and because of the brand, the quality, the clout, the, all, all the other stuff, they can charge such a high premium and no one bats an eye. And, and, and unfortunately, that's the reality we live in because the micro brands have an uphill battle to prove themselves since they don't have a brand identity. And that's a, a big part of it. So it's just in the reverse because you do have a lot of brands that are far more expensive than they should cost. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard unless you're in the industry, you inside, you see it. You're like, mm, you could get a mini repeater for a, a fraction of that from another guy who actually makes mini repeaters. But because of the name, you want it, I want it because, you know, we're all just, you know, you know, we're just, we are what we are in, in this consumeristic uh, Keep it up with lifestyle. the Jones, is the Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's, there's so many micro brands that like, oh man, I'm like, no, you guys, you guys are doing it all right. You guys are doing the right thing. And you have just a, a bigger task of proving it to the people. Yeah. One question I, I wanted to ask you, Rob, because I, I figured maybe you'd have more experience with this. Um, a lot of times people say that about the Myota 9015, but in your experience, what do micro brands actually have access to in terms of movement? Like, can any old guy just walk into walk over to Swatch and be like, yeah, let me get some Edas or walk over to Salida and be like, yeah, let me get some Salidas. Like, how does that process go? Because sometimes I'd have to guess there are some people really, they want to create this amazing watch, but their only option in terms of a movement is really that route. And the crazy thing is even that's the only option. And there's talks about production going down on the 9015 and, and, uh, and maybe some backlog. And there have been recent backlogs on orders from micro brands. They're having problems getting the, the movement in. So from your experience, like how easy it is, like me, Joe Blow, I want to start my brand guy. How easy or how hard or difficult it is for me to actually go over there and be like, you know what, I, I want a Swiss movement. It's not the easiest, but money talks. So if you're talking about small batches, you might have to settle for somebody who might be easier to access and that would work with your Chinese manufacturers. And some of them already do. Some already have the connections to work with, you know, Seiko, Myota, or whoever. I don't really necessarily know because I haven't actually tried. But I know these brands that I've worked with and called with, they have an easier connection. Sometimes they have to go make the connection directly in their homeland, whether it's Switzerland or you know, Japan or wherever, you, know, you have the trade shows, you know, uh, they'll make direct contact. And again, you can't just do it for everyone. So you can't just like walk in and be like, Edda, give me your stuff because they make a very, very select few for their own. And they don't, for a while, they were not selling to anyone else. Mm. And then some brands started getting them because they were able to talk them into selling them stuff because they, again, money talks, how much money you're going to put into it, how many orders you can do. They might not sell you just 300, but they might sell you 3000, you know? And if you're willing to throw the money around, maybe you can buy something of better quality or just more quantity. So it depends. Some people have gone other routes. Some people have gone with like a Eterna and there's a lot of other manufacturers. There's so many manufacturers in Switzerland that people don't even know of mm -hmm. and uh, they'll go with them. And it's really just the person, the money they have, the negotiation skills, the being at the right place at the right time and meeting the right people because it's not the easiest. It's not like something you can do Alibaba and try to get like, you can probably get cases and everything else. And you have a lot of your just like point and click watches out there, but there's some stuff that to get better quality, you have to put more work into it. And it's actually harder to get access to things. So you have to convince them. You're basically sales pitching these people like, this is what we're going to do. It's going to be really successful. You know, we plan on getting this much, this is how much money we're going to give you how much volume we want because we're going to have a repeat. We're going to grow this business. You know, how easy it is not, I don't think it's easy to be honest. Not as easy as you think. Cool, cool. Uh, right, Good place it. to leave it. Like I said, I got the yell, so that's, that's really all I wanted at the end of the day. So that's it, very man. Cool. Rob, it was. I mean, it was great having you, man. Just, just to to break down some of this stuff because it's it's there's there's so much. I, I don't think people realize just how much stuff happens like behind the scenes in the watch industry. Um, like why this is this way, why this is that way you know, what connections were made years ago, what connections no longer exist. Like there's so much backstory and so much that, that goes on. Like I remember the video we did about the Tiffany thing. There was so much stuff you told me that I had no clue about in terms of the history between them and the brand. Um, so it, it, it's, it's very interesting. Side note, I know they just bought them, but it, it, it was 
I, I can't wait to see one if LVMH does what they did again, and two if they're actually going to bring a brand like Tiffany over there, or if, or if they're just going to focus on like Bulgari and then the, their higher end brands. But um, that's that's going to be interesting. They've been pretty smart about how they go about doing business with the brands they've acquired, and it'll take some time. We won't see anything in the next maybe two years. I think it's going to take a little bit of co- a couple of years before we see any of the change, but. They're very, I trust LVMH in, the, in their, uh, in what they do. They're very smart. Like they, they, uh, they did Bulgari well, even 10 years mm-hmm. ago when I was just like, you guys are going to F this up and they surprised and they did it well. And then they said, yeah. you know what, we're going to invest a ton of money. We're going to get the right designers. We're going to push it people's down, people down, uh, pe- down people's throats and we're going to do it right. And, and they actually not only recently, I think have finally gained that traction where people are just like, Oh yeah, I would wear it and yeah. completely disregard the fact that they're a jewelry house, that they're a Roman jewelry house. Um, doesn't even matter now because they've broken all these world records. They, they proven themselves and it took a long time, but they got there. So what's, what's crazy is I, I look at that brand now and I'm just like, I know it's crazy to say this, a brand that sends 10, that sells 10, 11, $12,000 watches. But I think there's a lot of value there. If that makes sense compared to some of the other stuff I'm seeing around that price range, like I feel like there's more value there than some of the other brands that, that we talk about. Oh, hundred percent. If I had the money, I would have bought a, a used Finissimo age. Oh, yeah. I had a friend who did and he got such a great deal on it. And I'm like, dude, you're so out of the curb, but he's also a, one of my closest friends and he keeps buying and he has like my dream collection now. Cause he keeps like getting all the best things. Right. <laughs> I was like, dude, he's like, should I buy this Alaska product? I'm like, that's my favorite. Omega Speedmaster. To this day, I don't own a Speedmaster because I just, you know, the opportunity hasn't been there. But if I could have, I would have bought in that Omega, uh, the Alaska project because it's loud, it's big, it's red, it's bright, and it doesn't look like a Speedmaster. So I was like, I would buy it. You should buy it. So he bought it for like six thousand dollars now, and they went up to like fifteen or twenty or whatever they are now, which is stupid. But I'm uh, he's ahead of the curve. He's, same thing with the, the Finissimo. He got a really good deal on it, and those aren't only going to go up. Mm. So. Don't buy them all because it saved me one. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, you! Listen I think, to me. I think that's a great that's a great way to to end to today's episode. Rob, man, thanks a lot. Yep. Um, Brad, send us off there. Yeah, man. So, uh, so Rob, Rob has a way cooler Instagram than either of us do. So go follow him at Spanish Rob on Instagram. Uh, follow me at Budding Watch Enthusiast. Follow Ricardo uh, at Ready Set Watch. Follow Bearded Time. Follow the Watch with this channel. Uh, click that subscribe button. Go over to Budding Watch Enthusiasts. Click the subscribe button. Um, yeah, that's it. If you're listening to us on a podcast app, subscribe to the Watch with Us feed here as well. And uh, yeah, so that's it for episode eight. Spash Rob, thank you very much. Probably not the last time we're going to be seeing you on this podcast, oh, I'm sure. Definitely not. Uh, we're going to yeah. have to get you on this as a reoccurring guest. <laughs> sure, I'd love that. When Thanks for having it's... me. When Ish hits the fan, we'll we'll bring you on. Please do, please do. Yeah, we, have, we just have to wait for the next criminal YouTuber to uh to come along. <laughs> Hopefully not again. Hopefully, and, and Hopefully not again. But, but guys, uh, thank you guys very much for listening and watching. We'll see you all the next time.